A very warm welcome back to Hospitality Tomorrow 3. My apologies, I'm calling in from Cape Town and the lines got a little bit tricky from where we are in London to where we're connecting here at underneath the Table Mountain. Welcome back again to Hospitality Tomorrow 3. We hope you had a good coffee break. We're gonna jump straight into the next session, which is going to be a very interesting one. It's on the developing shape of the global economic recovery. And we have exactly the right person for this conversation. It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage, Lisa Engel. She's the Managing Director of Berkeley Capital Group, an agile, innovative turnkey partner for global investors on sustainable hospitality investments and developments. And importantly, Lisa is also the founder and CEO of WIH Global, an organization that we've heard Jonathan talk about already. And so I'm going to ask Lisa to join us on the stage. And please, Lisa, tell us a little bit about WIH Global and why you're so excited about it. Oh, thank you, Anita. Well, first and foremost, very excited because we can count you as a wonderful member of it, as with Jonathan and David earlier on. So thank you for that. Um, WIH Global started in April during the first lockdown as the creation of WIH, which was to create a community for women in hospitality who build, fund, operate, and advise in hospitality. And it evolved into WIH Global, and we are rolling it out right now for 500 members, so 450 women and 50 men. Um, and it really is, it's a not-for-profit global best-in-class community where we believe that by collaborating, uh, collaborating, we have greater impact and we can create a hospitality industry that is more diverse and inclusive. So our pillars are, we have mentoring, we have knowledge share, and we have outreach. And it truly is one where as we bring on members across the globe, so America's EMEA and APAC, we are thrilled to create a community that we can all drive for change and, and a positive impact. So thank you for allowing us to introduce. Fantastic. And I love how you've evolved the organization, Lisa, along with Marlos to, as you say, it's not about 50-50 men and women and that be equality. It's 100% of everyone being Absolutely. a part of this. So, Madam, I hand you the stage. It's all yours. Over to you. Enjoy. Thank you very much. So I'm pleased to introduce, as Anita was saying, we have the developing shape of the global economic recovery, which meets, um, which markets will be the best and what are the implications for the hospitality sector. So I am very honored to introduce to you Wesley Paul. He is founding partner and chairman of Gemini Analytics, and he was managing director and global head of investments at JP Morgan. So Wes, over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I have the, uh, the challenging task right now of uh, uh, addressing the, the the economic outlook from where we sit today, and obviously with a huge amount of uncertainty, this is uh, this is at best our a good guess based on uh, inputs from all of the various organisations around the world. I've got quite a bit of material to go through, um, but we really have to start with uh, with the COVID uh, uh, situation itself right now and. Look, the vaccines are, are on the way. We've already had the Pfizer vaccine rolled out. We know it's going to take time to get um, uh, vaccinations going across the world. Uh, there are challenges right now in terms of, you know, just the supply chain and the logistics of this. But if you look at these charts here, uh, just to give you some context, 70 million people so far infected uh, by the COVID uh, virus with about 2 million deaths. It's actually less than that. And I'll come to the regional differences on the right-hand side of this page. But to give you some context uh, in terms of pandemics, the Spanish flu in, in 1918, uh, it's estimated that it actually uh, infected 500 million people and killed as many as 50 million people. Um, uh, during that time. And it's important to realize that of the 500 million people that were infected, the global population back then was only about 2 billion people. So that's about 25% of the global population was infected by this. So if we look at the context here, 70 million against a population of about 8 billion and about 2 million um, deaths, as, as sad as that, uh, as that is, um, this has been luckily um, 
a generally mild pandemic as it as, as relates to history. Um, but obviously the impact has been uh, gigantic in terms of the economic impact, which is the, the main focus of this presentation. If we look at the regional differences, you can see um, clearly um, the charts on the left of this page really show that we have not flattened the curve. Uh, yes, the vaccinations are coming, but they are arriving at a time when um, uh, infection rates are actually rising in Europe and in the United States. Um, Asia and Africa, you can see, have flattened their curves. Um, Asia is, is uh, obviously a very broad region, and the numbers here are affected by what's going on in India and Pakistan and a few of the other South Asian nations. Um, we all know that China, and I'll look at China in a minute, has had a better experience with COVID, having gone in early, have come out early, and are generally less impacted because of that from the economic perspective. But the points I want to raise here are, look, we, we've got the vaccines coming. We've had a year of mixed lockdowns around the world. The length of the lockdowns are the actual key metric about how the recovery will look. So until we can actually get these curves flattened, we can get the vaccines rolled out with lower infection rates until that starts to happen in Europe and the Americas, the outlook for those two regional economies are going to be difficult to predict. Sally, can I get the next slide up, please? So in looking at that, um, I put these two charts on this page together. Um, the chart on the left really deserves a page on its own and a whole presentation on its own because at first instance, when you look at it, you can see that V-shaped recovery that we have been talking about that we were expecting to happen. You can see that the yellow line, which is China, they went in earlier than everybody else and their V-shaped recoveries are happening somewhat later. But you can see that the trends after the recovery are quite different. And it's gonna be very important to understand this, particularly in terms of uh, relative economic performance, because not only has China come out of this earlier with a, a shorter lockdown, but it is growing at 8% and will continue to outpace growth elsewhere in the world. And this is a, a situation that will, will drive the Chinese economy to become a preeminent economy very quickly. And, and there are issues obviously associated with that. You can see the numbers more clearly in the simple table that I put on the right side of this. You can see um, really China in 2020 is the only economy of the major economies that's gonna post anything like positive economic growth. They actually reported something like 7% industrial production for November today. So things look good in China and they're coming back. And you can see they get back to about an 8% growth in 2021. By contrast, look at the other major emerging economy, India clearly suffered very badly in, in 2020. And while their recovery will happen in 2021, that means they're gonna be lagging somewhat. Sally, can I get the next slide, please? Now, this is an important slide as well, because on the left side of this chart, what we're showing here is the actual uh, amount of stimulus that governments have put into place in response to the pandemic. And these stimulus packages have ranged from um, supporting companies, furloughing employees, um, providing bailouts to airlines, which I'll come to later and so on and so forth. Um, and you would think that the amount of money that governments have uh, injected as stimulus would actually reflect in the economic performance that's going to happen thereafter. But if you look on the right-hand side of the page here, uh, again, an echo of what I said in the previous page, you can see that China is outpacing the rest of the world even though they, they haven't really had that much stimulus into their economy. And you can see the big issue for the whole of this page is really two things. One, it's not the size of the stimulus that governments have made that are gonna determine the outturn. 
um, and that the outturn it, itself globally, it's very uneven. So we have an, a, 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 a global economy that is not synchronized. Some countries are doing well, others are doing actually very badly. Next slide, please. Um, now, we can talk a lot about debt to GDP, and I, I guess it's going to become a bigger and bigger issue that people will, will talk about um, uh, going forward. And economists are already wringing their hands about um, the, the, the levels of debt that, that we see uh, around the world. Um, but look, let's put this in context for everyone. The actual level of debt is, is big. It's 260 trillion US dollars, and that's government and, and uh, corporate and household debt. So we are about as indebted Sorry, as we have ever been. Trouble hearing you. We have, um, you know, we have a look at, if you look at this, that's about 330% of world GDP. Uh, so this is a big number, and it's something we should be worried about. But here's the good news, I suppose. 92% um, of that debt is actually investment grade. So it's uh, uh, owned by countries or corporates who have a, a higher credit rating, and therefore they do have access to capital to refinance themselves. Obviously a very big issue here and, and, and a help at this point is that interest rates are at historical lows. They're practically zero. So um, financing this level of debt is not going to be an issue in the near term. Um, I will point out though that, you know, in the emerging markets world, we've got about 4 trillion of debt maturing in 2021. And very few of those countries have the ability to repay that debt uh, at short notice. So we're going to be looking for some debt relief programs that have to kick in to help out. Um, 185 trillion of that 260 is actually in mature markets and the United States owns more than 50% of that. Um, and then finally, if you look, at, um, you look at China on this list here, um, it looks quite low in terms of the numbers, but understand that that masks a very significant, very significant level of uh, non-financial corporate debt. So actually China's running with debt levels of about 330% as well of GDP. So um, the fact that they're coming out, the fact that they're growing is good news for um, uh, debt risk in China, but they've got a lot of debt that they need to uh, wind down as well. Next slide, please. Now here's a feature of uh, those of you that have lived through the Japan deflationary episode that started in 1989 and has lasted uh, really almost up to now. Um, we have this issue where we call uh, corporates uh, zombie companies. Uh, not a very nice name, but what it means is that the, uh, the income of these companies is has a ratio below one. So they actually don't generate enough income to service existing debt. And if you look at the chart here, you can see on the left in the United States how this zombie debt has actually exploded quite significantly. Um, through this period. Now, the important thing here is, is, yes, this is a big problem, but you should also know that some of the companies in that um, blue line on that uh, chart on the left are big companies. We've got Exxon there, Boeing, um, all of the airlines, United, Delta, American, Macy's is there, Ford is there. And these are big household names that clearly are struggling either with their business models um, and certainly will need to continue to get some amount of government support uh, beyond what's uh, already been given. If you look on the right-hand side of this page, you can see that it's, it's a biggish problem for the whole US financial market. This index is the Russell 3000 index, which is a broader measure of all of the US companies rather than the uh, the Dow Jones or the uh, S&P 500. So it's a broader measure. And you can see that one sixth of all companies in the Russell 3000 now um, fall into that category of having a uh, debt coverage ratio of, of, of uh, less than one. Next slide, please. 
Um, here we get into the seeds of future problems. Um, when we emerge out of this pandemic and we start to get the economic uh, growth coming back, and we hope, as I've shown you in the previous slides, that this starts to happen in 2021, we're still going to be dealing with uh, the after effects of this and with companies going bankrupt with problems everywhere, uh, unemployment is going to be a big issue and it's going to be a big political issue. And importantly, the chart on the left is the important one here because the unemployment, the, the real burden of unemployment has fallen on the youth, on young people around the world. This is not a phenomenon of just Europe. It's not a phenomenon of the United States. It's a phenomenon everywhere. And how we, we um, bring young people in to the uh, workforce, how we train them up in the skills they need to have, um, uh, these are gonna be the challenges for politicians going forward. And understand that, that unemployment, together with the economic problems that we've got, together with the growing social inequality that's happened in the last uh, several decades, um, these are seeds for problems that, that are not small and people should factor them in and understanding what the challenges are that lie ahead. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit of a focus now on where the GDP is happening and where growth is happening and where wealth is being created. I wanted to put a few slides in here to give everyone some context. You can see from the development of the charts on the left, if you, uh, read from left to right, and the same with the three charts on the, on the right-hand side of the page, reading left to right. Uh, in each of these cases, you can see, in fact, that what's happening is a GDP, whether it's on a per capita basis or whether it's just outright GDP and current prices or whatever, you can see that Asia is becoming an increasingly bigger part of the GDP pie. Um, and, and growth in these markets, as we've seen, from the earlier slides is only gonna uh, improve because they, came, they went in and they came out faster and have dealt with the problems. Next slide, please. This slide actually talks about that in a bit more detail. The left, uh, the football you see on the left shows uh, wealth uh, and how it's distributed around the world. You can see the United States has a big slug of that now, about a third nearly of wealth. You can see where China sits at the moment and how it has grown uh, through time. And then the chart on the right, we wanted to put something here, again, em emphasizing what's going on in Asia, a massive uh, growth in, in the middle class in Asia. And obviously this is gonna be a region that will be thriving as wealth um, uh, grows in this uh, area. And obviously uh, people in the hospitality sector should be considering uh, the implications for this. Next slide, please. Uh, here again, uh, a much clearer view, and this is forecasting out. The data goes back to 2018 here, it's the base forecasting out 10 years, and you can see that um, effect much more clearly in terms of the growth of India uh, and China in particular, in terms of how wealth is shifting uh, eastwards. Next slide, please. This is a summary slide. I won't go through the points here. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, this deck, by the way, is gonna be made available to, uh, to everyone. But the key points, I think, from this first section is really that the shape and the pace of the recovery that's going to happen here is gonna be dependent on um, how governments manage their lockdown processes right now the speed of the vaccine rollout and the efficacy of that vac those vaccines as they go to market. Uh, and then importantly as well, that the COVID-19 as it morphs into COVID-20 doesn't mutate to a point where we need new vaccines. So we are sort of out of the main woods in that we've now got vaccines coming over the horizon, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, now what I'm going to try and do to keep us all on time is to run towards uh, just the hospitality sector and the implications for all of this. Next slide, please. Uh, skip again. There you go. Um, this is the hotel industry. I've done it by region. Many of you would have seen these numbers. Um, they're horrible. 
Um, quarter on quarter in terms of improvement look good. So coming out of Q2 into Q3, and then obviously as we go into Q4, we're starting to get some, uh, some recovery. But please understand that, that the hotel industry is going to be very dependent on um, tourism coming back. Tourism itself is going to be dependent on borders uh, reopening. And when the borders open, the air travel industry is going to be ready to be able to scale up at the right price to get people moving again. And there's a, there's a, a serial connection between all of these events that, that, that have to happen. And each event has to create a level of confidence for the next one to really kick in. Um, if you compare Q3 uh, 2019 to Q3 2020, you can see the scale of the uh, fall in terms of, uh, of occupancy. And um, what we've done here is we've looked at both the traditional narrow measure of, of RevPAR, but we put in TrevPAR here now because we think, you know, we will encourage hotel owners to be looking for revenue streams beyond just renting their rooms out so that they can generate other income in the meantime. Um, and then you can see labor costs and, and overall uh, um, uh, operating expenses. Um, the industry really needs uh, to recognize that this is not going to happen quickly. They need to uh, hunker down still. Um, things are improving, but uh, the pace is going to be uh, quite slow. Uh, now let's look at um, uh, how uh, the next slide, please. I put this slide in here because one of the themes that, that Lisa and I talked about is how technology is going to change um, uh, the normal. So um, the view we have is that pandemics are are going to be a, a fear and certainly may be um, a, a problem going forward more regularly than every hundred years. Uh, we know the vaccine programs are going to be designed to target a solution to a particular virus type. So the vaccines being rolled out today are targeting a, a coronavirus uh, for, 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 for its particular uh, solution. Um, but if you look at the technology and the response that innovators have developed around um, the uh, threats that exist from pandemics, this is a good example. This is a company we know very well. It's a partner company to Gemini. And you can see that it is from a, you know, from just from the start of this year, it's already now uh, introduced its technology into 28 million square meters of space. A number of hotels have already picked it up. And what this technology does, it kills all types of pathogens by producing hydrogen peroxide in a low dose that is uh, not dangerous to human health, that actually produces negative ions that float around, they attack the positive ions of, of the viruses, kills, their, uh, kills them by destroying their lipid layers, and then it settles and forms an electrostatic layer on the surfaces of your workstation or whatever. And if a COVID germ lands on that, it obviously gets destroyed as well. And the good news is it's not narrowly defined against COVID. It actually is a broad spectrum solution that actually kills all types of, of, of virus and all types of, of bacteria. And, and therefore, it, it's a very smart, very sensible solution to preventative measures going forward. Uh, the other great story behind it, by the way, is that it, it, because it, it kills uh, bacteria and stuff like that, it makes rooms smell fresher. So if you're in a hotel and you've got uh, carpets or you've got curtains and stuff that smell uh, because the room's not been occupied, this technology actually deals with that as well. So the importance here is not just so much about this technology, but to show you how industry can innovate and that we need to understand there are solutions if we apply ourselves to some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, okay, the next slide, please. Now I'm gonna look a little bit on the airline sector. And um, uh, first of all, a good place to start is to say, how is how has COVID affected us in relation to past experiences with, uh, with epidemics that have happened? And of course we've had SARS, we've had MERS and we've had a, um, we've had some of these events happening. You can see from this chart, 
if we look at the impact of, of the SARS, uh, there have been two or three SARS uh, outbreaks, you can see that it really impacted Asia in particular. Um, North America and Europe were really not badly impacted at all. And, and the one thing it did, which is very important because of SARS and because of the experience that, that Asian countries had with it, they were better prepared, okay, going into this uh, COVID uh, uh, virus. They became accustomed to using masks and so on and so forth. And many people will say that has been one of the key reasons why they've dealt with the, uh, the pandemic better than Europe, better than the United States or South America. Next slide, please. Um, so now, you know, we looked at, at past pandemics. Let's look at past financial um, uh, problems that have impacted the world and how has that impacted uh, airline travel. And you can see here, we're looking back at 9-11, we're looking back at the 2008 financial crisis. And you can see the bumps that they created in terms of, of a fall in uh, air, airline travel, uh, uh, but then recovered fairly quickly soon after. And the question mark there is basically saying, so how has COVID impacted um, air travel in relation to those financial events or in the case of 9-11 uh, political events? So the next slide, please. It's a bad story and here it is. Um, we're down 60%. And what we've done here is we've mapped 1945 to 2020 to give you a real understanding of the scale of the drop-off. Um, and you can see, um, you know, we're really down 60% and that's a cataclysmic fall from where we've been. Next slide, please. Uh, the financial impact, uh, 400, well, 350, 360 billion of revenue loss so far. Uh, the worst part is you can see the revenue losses are still growing. If you look at the latest numbers, the November numbers, there's still those little bars are still big uh, and it's happening all over the world. But you can see North America in particular uh, and Europe. Um, next slide. Um, seat capacities have, uh, have fallen quite dramatically. You can see how that's uh, that shifted um, between regions. Uh, the stories, um, in fact, if you go to the next slide, it's a, it's a better slide to look at. Um, you can see from this slide that the plan, the dotted blue um, purple line at the top was showing what the original sort of expectations were in planning. But you can see now the big drop off that we talked about that started to happen in April of this year. Domestic travel is coming back. International travel is still flat. Um, and needs revision uh, uh, to get back. So you've got real problems there. Next slide. Um, the scale of the bailouts. Um, you can see here that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I could conclude here that the governments really now own airlines. So look at the scale of the bailout in the United States. We've amplified the, uh, the, the small bars in that other area there. And you can see everyone is having to, to bail out their, um, their industry. Uh, last slide, the next slide, please. So um, a few thoughts here as I, I, I round this up and then I'm gonna take some questions is, uh, look, uh, we, we're in a bad place. Um, we are coming out of it. Um, I actually also wanna say that I think when governments stop their stimulus packages, we also have another dip coming. So people should be prepared for some form of a dip during Q1 as governments start to pull back. So, um, you know, uh, another dip coming and more bankruptcies probably once government support ends. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, Lisa, you wanna uh, pick up now and ask any questions that people have? Sorry, Lisa, I can't hear you. Lisa, I can't hear you. So sorry. Yes, given the time, uh, why don't we just ask one quick query from the audience, which is what are the risks that you envision given the shifting of uh, wealth, especially as you were alluding to with Asia? So that's an audience query for you. How do I see um, what, what risks you envision with wealth given the distribution changes? 
Yeah, well, wealth is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword as relates to, to Asia and it, uh, particularly with China. Um, but um, look, Asia is already wealthy. You know, you're going you're, you're gonna to see more movies like Crazy Rich Asians coming out all over the place. And, and they have more disposable wealth. Um, they're going to spend it and they'll enjoy it. And the Asian region is a, definitely a region. If, if I was running a big multinational corporation, I'd be looking to, to, to be making sure I've got a, a big hub uh, in Asia. It's gonna be big for air travel. It's already coming back faster than everybody else. Um, but there are geopolitical issues that will go alongside that, which is as the Chinese economy becomes huge, as wealth moves it to China, uh, how the West deals with China and how we, we, we try and manage that relationship. It's probably one of the biggest things that that Joe Biden has right now on his list of things to do. Does he engage with China now and, and cooperate or do we confront? And, and as we leave the Trump administration behind, what we've seen is confrontation up to now. And the question is, is there a way that these two uh, superpower economies can actually collaborate and cooperate for the benefit of everyone? Uh, because what we don't want is a trade war. What we don't want it is some uh, uh, fight for hegemony uh, around the world. So I think um, as I look at things here, the risks are stacked, unfortunately, against a, a, um, a, a sensible solution. Um, but um, the world needs, the last thing the world needs right now is, is trade tensions accelerating as we're trying to come out of this COVID problem. So uh, I'd be looking to um, the China situation, uh, not just with the United States, but with Europe and, and, and G7 in general and its Asian uh, colleagues. And then I'd be looking as well at um, how China uses its wealth, because uh, strategically, um, you know, we've got to be careful that China doesn't push its way around because of its wealth. So yeah, those would be the issues I'd, I'd focus on. Okay. Look, to cover a lot in a very short period of time. So No, absolutely. And, and so conscious of time, I, I have a slew of queries I want to ask, but we don't have time. So at least I will end with what you were saying, which is it's a tough road ahead, but the positives, and let's bring the positives, as you were stating, whilst China is 8% growth next year, at least Europe, we're looking at a 5.2%, 5 5 but vaccines, Biden, low rates, stable banking systems, strong stock markets, digital transformation you were alluding to, and companies becoming agile and nimble to change and, and pivoting. So we'll, we'll, we'll end on that. Um, thank you so, so much, Wes. And over to you, Sally and Jonathan, for the next. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Anita.